Yes. Okay. It's Grant Cameron, and I'm speaking from uh, Canada. Good afternoon to Denmark and everybody, and uh, it's good to be able to talk to you again. Uh, the presentation I'm going to do today is actually a very long presentation, but I'm going to just do a little section of it. And it was a, it was, I gave it a couple of weeks ago in Los Angeles, and it went over fairly well. And it's um, it comes from the fact that I was to do an article for the Free Foundation on what they call contact modalities. And this is um, a screen that shows when I first had my sort of download experience in 2012, um, I was um, done, I had done a number of lectures on consciousness. And one was in Florida where I met Ray Hernandez, who runs the Free Foundation, the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters. And it was at that um, event that Ray and I first talked about consciousness where he came to his first conference. And then a couple of days later, He's on the Miami freeway and he has a download experience. And in that download experience, he's, he's sort of taken out of his body and he's sort of shown in, in visual images, sort of a wheel. And in the middle of the wheel is consciousness and all around the outside of the, the wheel, there's spirits and ghosts, near death experiences, remote viewing, channeling, mystical meditation, UFO contact, shamanic journeys, all this kind of stuff. And it's all linked into the middle with consciousness. And so he was sort of given sort of the idea that he should go out and, and advance this idea. And so that's when he started the Free Foundation. And basically, I had basically the same sort of uh, message in 2012, which said it's all consciousness. Because I had had a UFO sighting in 1975, tried to publish a book, nobody would publish it. And at that point, I just wanted to know, um, somebody must know what I had seen. And so I. Um, was looking all these years for an answer. And basically, in 2012, I was basically sort of gotten this idea in my head that it was all consciousness. And I really didn't know what consciousness meant or anything. But uh, so I was on the same road as, as Ray. So what you're going to see today is, is a lecture I've done on contact modalities, which basically means that whether you're talking to an alien or a spirit or a dead person or your higher self or whatever you're talking to, Basically, the idea is it's all the same thing. There really is no difference. We're parsing it. We're saying, you know, channelers are better than people who had experiences uh, on ship, and uh, people who have had near death experiences are better than people who had out of body experiences. And we sort of argue and parse all this kind of stuff. But basically, it's all the same sort of thing. And I have, uh, when, when I was going to do an article on this contact modalities, I, I started by deciding I would put down all these different types of contact modalities in a list. And I came up with over 70 different things. And basically, they all come down to the same thing. And I'll give you sort of the key to what, what I think is behind all this stuff. So that, that's basically how this thing starts. And we're going to go through, I'm going to try to do just a little bit of the basics at the beginning. And then I'm going to try to show you some of the videos that I didn't actually get to show in Los Angeles, some very interesting videos dealing with um, um, the power of the mind, not the brain, but the power of the, of the, of the mind of what people can actually do. So let's go, I, I call it shutting down the bubble machine. So what I'm gonna say at the bottom line of this thing is that what, what's happening is it's not things turning on in the brain that are causing this to happen, it's turning things off in the brain that, that allow you to get out of your sort of left brain ego mind and tap into this field. So you can tap into the field, you can pull music, you can pull inventions, you can talk to dead people, you can talk to aliens, but the ability is to shut down what I call the bubble machine in the brain. So you have, you know, uh, whether it's smoke or bubbles or whatever, the brain is causing a lot of noise. It's a very noisy signal and you can't tap into the signal. If you can, if you can shut down this, I call the bubble machine, then you can access a clearer signal and, and read what's going on. Now, um, here's... Um, let's see, let me try to shut this here. Um, two, two things. Well, we sort of assume that what happens in your mind is, or in your brain is, is what, what is the accurate thing. And we, we know, for example, that the vast majority of the things that your brain is telling you are basically wrong. For example, um, 
it wasn't until a couple of years ago, maybe 400 years ago, that people believed the world was round. Before then, everybody believed the world was flat. And that was very evident. Your eyes, everything about you told you that, no, the world is flat. Don't argue with me, it's flat. It, it's very apparent, apparent that it's flat. It wasn't until we actually got more um, information from outside sources, for example, uh, astronauts flying around the earth or people uh, sailing their ship into the ocean and, and not falling off the edge of the earth. It wasn't until we got more information that we realized that the, the, what the brain was giving us through the eyes was wrong. And we suddenly realized, no, the world is round. And it's the same thing we used to believe that the sun rotated around the earth. And that's very evident. Your, your brain tells you, no, no, the sun is going around the earth. And it's not until we had other stuff like telescopes and stuff like this that we started to realize that, no, actually, it's the other way around, that the, the earth is going around the sun. So this is um, an example of how the brain has basically showing you the wrong things. Um, a, cu a couple more. Ego. Uh, we, have a, we have an ego. We, have, we believe that we are a unique individual that I and Pia and everybody's different. Everybody's a, a, a unique thing. They're just floating around in a meaningless time and space. And what we've discovered when we get more information that the brain has got that wrong as well. Uh, the ego is a creation of the brain. And that is, there's a lot of evidence we have now. And one that I would suggest people uh, look at is a, a TED talk that was done by Jill Bolte Taylor, who was a neuroanatomist at Harvard University who had a left brain hemorrhage. And when her left brain was shut down with the, the blood flooding the brain, she suddenly realized that her ego was gone and that this little voice inside her head, so you have this little voice. She said not only did the voice sort of tone down, it was turned off like a mute button on a, on a TV remote control. It just basically was off. And the entire time that her brain was shut down with, I think was for six or seven weeks, uh, there was no voice in her head. So the ego is a creation of the brain. And we believe this is a real thing. It's actually really going on that this is, this is reality. And in, in, in fact, it is something that's been created by the brain. The same thing we find with psychedelics, that if you take people who have done psychedelics, they will tell you, number one, uh, the ego is crushed. That there, it's like the ego death, uh, the ego dies, and they suddenly realize that everything is alive and conscious. So the ego is something that the brain is creating. So it's, again, it's like a bad signal. It's giving us stuff that really isn't true. Uh, stress. Jill Bolte Taylor stated, stated that when she had her left brain hemorrhage, there was no stress. It, it was completely gone. So stress is something that the brain is, is sort of creating. It really doesn't really exist. Uh, the same thing, uh, we have an idea that everything is solid. We have the idea that, that um, you know, the table is solid. And we now realize with more information that the brain is wrong. The brain thinks it's solid, but when you get more information tapped into the system, you realize that it's basically all space. There is almost no matter inside a, a, a material object. It's all space, and it's the way it's held together by fields that makes it appear like it's, it's solid, but it's not really solid. We now know that things don't have color. We see color, but there is no such thing as color. It's a, it's a, it's a frequency of a vibration. There really is no color. It's just a frequency which, the, which is being interpreted as a color. Uh, there is no out there, out there. We have this idea, and, and this is one of the things that I think that ties into the UFO field, is that we suddenly realize that um, everything is one. Uh, there was Jan Hartson, who's the international director from MUFON, asked Ben Rich in 1993, how did the UFOs get here? How does the propulsion system work? And Ben said, let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? And Jan said, well, that means everything in time and space is connected. And Ben Rich said, that's how it works. And this is, goes to the concept of oneness, that everything is actually one thing, that there is only sort of like one electron, one, uh, one of everything, that there, it's all the same thing, and that there, is, there are ideas of, of this um, stuff out there really may not be true. That's only a thing that the brain is almost like the flat earth is sort of giving us the impression, but it's not really true. And the next thing is we, we have the idea that, that, um, the, that everything is moving. And we now sort of understand that it's, it's, everything is, is, is sort of stationary, that your, your, your brain is taking 
uh, snapshot, snapshot, like maybe whatever, you know, hundreds a second or whatever. And they're putting them together and it's like a movie film that it, everything is stationary, everything is now, and that your, your brain is creating this sort of illusion of things moving. Time and space, we now know through uh, a lot of stuff that time and space may not exist. These are creations of uh, the uh, human brain. And as I'll show you later on, we now know that if you shut down the, um, the uh, uh, temporal and parietal lobes in the brain, uh, these are the two parts of the brain that create time and space. If you shut those two par uh, things down in the brain by doing meditation and yoga at the same time or by very slow drumming and dancing at the same time, you can sort of overload these circuits. They will shut down and you will suddenly um, get the idea that you, there is no time and space. So people will say that's the illusion. And that may be true, but it appears more that the illusion is created by the brain that you have time and space. And when you shut down the brain parts that are doing that, you suddenly realize what real reality is. And that's the whole concept is when you shut these sections down, you actually realize what's actually going on. You get more information and it's not what the brain is telling you. It's something completely different. Uh, the, the fear center, this is the, uh, Jim Bolte Taylor talked about this as well. And this is kind of unique because people will say, you know, there's, there's fear and you have to deal with fear and it's a real thing. And she stated that when she had her left brain hemorrhage, the entire time that she had the hemorrhage, there was absolutely no concept of fear. It did not exist. And so the question is, does fear actually exist or is it a creation of, um, uh, the amygdala? And here's a kind of an important one. This goes back, I was just, when I was in um, Denmark last year in, in Copenhagen, uh, we went for a tour. Pio uh, can tell you the place I wanted to go um, was the, uh, the Neil Bohr Institute. And, and the reason for that is, one, one of the concepts that we've got wrong is we have the idea that um, there was only 5,000 stars. When you take a look in a, in a sort of an area where there's not a lot of light, you can see 5,000 stars. And we used to believe that, that there was, uh, that's all there was. That's what the brain is telling you. There's only 5,000 stars. And when you get more information, when you get outside information fed in there and start to relearn what reality is, you realize that what, what you're seeing and what the brain is telling you is not what's really true. So here's the, the, the Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. And we went there and I actually wasn't really that interested in, in the institute. What I was interested in, if you see the, uh, the, on the left side is the institute, and we went around the left side of the institute and went through those trees and we went, you can see that, that, um, that path in the back behind the institute there. That's what I wanted to see because I'd written a book called Inspired, The Paranormal World of Creativity. And one of the things I had looked at in, in that was download experiences where a lot of music comes from. This is this whole idea of tapping into the field where if you can tap into the field, you have musicians who are getting songs in dreams, they're getting songs spontaneously. You get artists who are able to uh, sort of uh, go into an altered state and do art. Uh, you get Nobel Prize winners who will claim that their invention came through um, sort of a download experience. And here's Albert Einstein uh, had his experience. He talks about the dream, the dream of the toboggan going at the speed of light. And he stated that um, when that's happened, it was like my download experience, where he realized that um, uh, he had to, it, it was important. This was not an ordinary dream. And he said, I knew I had to understand that dream. In fact, you could say, and I would say, that my entire career was based on a meditation upon that dream. So basically, uh, his ideas, he, he was sort of inspired by this dream. So Albert Einstein got his invention through a dream. Uh, Niels Bohr, there's, there's two stories that he had two different dreams. One was the um, sort of the electrons spinning around the earth like they were attached uh, by, from strings. And the second one was uh, um, one where you have the, the sort of the quantum atom, which the electrons move in these different um, sort of shells where they're jumping from shell to shell. And that one, is, um, there's a story told that he had a dream of being at the horse track where he, they were narrating to him that electrons are moving like horses around a horse track and they can't step on the white line. They have to move from, from lane to lane. So there's a second one that came through a dream, but the third one is the one that links into the, um, the Bohr Institute. And that was uh, Werner Heisenberg. 
And these are, these are the three of the major inventions or the sort of the ideas of the, of the 20th century. And Werner Heisenberg's big idea was the uncertainty principle. And that came to him on that pathway in behind the, the, the Bohr Institute. He was talking about it was the middle of the night. Uh, Bohr had gone to Sweden or Switzerland to, to ski. He was a lecturer at the Institute at the time. He, he couldn't sleep. He was up in the middle of the night. He was walking in the park and he saw a guy walking in the dark in the park along the path and he was going under the light. So he would go under a light. He would be all lit up. Then he would suddenly disappear into the dark and then he would reappear again under the next light and he would disappear into the dark again. And that's where he got the whole idea of the, uh, the uncertainty principle. That's where it came from on, on that sort of thing. So this is this idea of, of the fact that we can tap into this field and that it has been done many times in the past and it'd be very advantageous to learn how to do this. But first you have to sort of understand um, how this all sort of fits together. The way we sort of interpret it in our modern world is that inventions come from very smart people. And I refer you to a study by Lewis Terman and these were called, uh, these people called themselves the termites. And this was a study that started in 1910. It was the longest longitudinal study ever done. And it was done in California and it was done with kids who they had picked these kids with 135, 140 IQs, very, very young in, in before they were uh, teenagers. And what they decided to do is they wanted to track these kids through their entire life. And in the end, they had 1,528 kids who were in this study and they tracked these kids through their entire life. And one of the key things that they learned was there was no connection whatsoever with creativity. Uh, not one single kid in the study of these smartest kids in California ever won a Nobel Prize. Nobody ever won a Pulitzer Prize. There was no major inventions from any of these people. Uh, the best that they had, and these were there was 26 of these kids who had IQs over 180. Um, the best I saw them record was a, a world a world known psychologist was one of them. Uh, there was actually two Nobel Prize winners that were actually talked to in this study. Uh, one, um, one I have their names here, uh, Sh uh, Shockley, who uh, co-invented the, the transistor, and Alvar Alvarez, who worked on nuclear magnetic resonance. And both these guys won Nobel Prizes. They were both interviewed for the study and rejected by the study. So they weren't brought into the study. So they had absolutely no, nobody who'd won a Nobel Prize. So we always have the idea that, that the people who are the really smart people are the ones who are uh, doing the inventions and the creativity. And one of the key things this thing showed was no, these people just became ordinary people and just had ordinary jobs. And that there was no correlation with uh, very, very creative people with people who are very, very smart. Now, here's uh, back to this thing with time. And the, there's, there's four different ones with time, but the one I want to show you here, and this is this idea that we believe there is time and space. I never really uh, understood this concept till a couple of months ago. I was in California. I was talking to Barbara Lamb, and Barbara Lamb is one of the, the key uh, people in the UFO field who regresses um, people who, um, you know, who believe their, their experiences have been on board the ship. And Barbara was telling me the story that what she does with experiencers is that um, when the experiencers on board the ship say it's their first encounter, uh, they're very scared, they don't know what's going on, uh, there's these beings moving around them or whatever. And so Barbara had determined that what she would do is she would try to calm these people down and rather than just allowing them to sort of uh, freak out in this uh, regression session. So what she would say to them, and she would sort of try to distract them, so she would say to them, you know, they would say, I'm scared. And she'd say, uh, so do you know what they're doing to you? And the person would go, no, no, I don't know what they're doing to me. And she'd say, well, why don't you ask? And then she said there'd be a long pause. And then the person would say, oh, they say they're looking at my kidney. They say I should go to the doctor. There's something wrong with my kidney. I should go to the doctor. And then she'd say, okay, look, to the, look on the, on the right-hand side. Who's standing beside you? describe the being and she would actually sort of like divert their attention away from the fear of the experience that they were having to look around the ship and describe stuff and stuff like that. The key to this whole thing is the fact that when that event first happened, none of that stuff happened. 
So what Barbara Lamb has actually done is she's gone back into the past to an event that took place and she changed the event. Because the first time around, they didn't ask about the kidney. They didn't look around the room. They didn't do any that kind of stuff. So it's basically, you would think that in the past, events are chiseled into stone. You can't change things that happened in the past. This shows very clearly because Barbara does it all the time. And I believe I asked Mary Rodwell the same question out of uh, Australia. And I said, have you found this as well? And she said, yes. So you have this situation where you can go into a past event and actually change the event. And the other thing that she talks, so that's the, the idea of time. And then you have the idea of space. So Barbara was, was in this conversation with Barbara. And then she said, and I asked Mary Rodwell, and Mary Rodwell says this happens too, that during the regression, she said she would ask the person to ask the alien this, ask him that. And the same thing happened with Chris Bledsoe. During Chris Bledsoe, if you know his experience, the transcript shows that basically he was asking all sorts of questions of the, of the beings. The, the regression said, ask him this, ask him that. And he was asking questions of the being. And so um, Barbara Lamb told me that she would be talking to these, these experiencers and they would basically say, um, you know, this is happening, that's happening. All of a sudden, the one person said, oh, uh, they said they want to talk to you. And so then she would start an actual conversation with the being. So this is an event that may have happened 40 years before. And suddenly the being wants to talk to Barbara. And Barbara was telling me the one story, and this had this idea of space when it suddenly made sense to me. She says to the, the beings talking to her, and I can't remember exactly what the event that Barbara was doing. She was in the garden working in something, whatever. And the being was describing this event that Barbara had had. And so Barbara said, oh, so were you there? And the being says to her, no, Barbara, I've never been to your planet. And this is the whole idea. So you start to look at, well, maybe they're not even here. Maybe they can actually project themselves. They can be in this world and they're actually in another world or go back to this oneness concept. It's all one. They don't even have to travel here. That is all one thing. They can just tap into the field and know exactly what's going on and because it's all the same thing. So this is this idea, and you will see this in, in other things. Dolores Cannon talks about this. I have a, a, this Mark sighting, this local guy, who had two sightings and later when he was talking to, this is a, a remote viewer, one of the um, people who worked for one of the top remote viewer guys who had run the US Air Force remote viewing program. Uh, she had done a, a reading for him and she said, uh, no, that, that, that was, he asked, he was asking, well, who was in those ships? She said, no, no, there's nobody in those ships. You sent the ship, you sent the things from the, from the future, from your future self, you sent it to yourself to wake yourself up. So when you start looking at all these kind of stuff, and there's a lot of this evidence, when you start gathering, there's a lot of evidence that shows that it's, it gets pretty weird, that there really may not be any time and space, and that we can move around and past future lives, and it's all now, almost like Bashar says when he's asked about time. He always says, look at your watch, what time is it? And the person will say, 2.30, and they say, no, no, it's now, it's always now, there is only now. And this is this whole thing that if you want to understand the UFO phenomena, I think you have to start to understand these kind of things that there may not be any time and space and that the, a lot of the stuff that the brain is telling us is not really true. That the reality, when you can shut these parts of the brain down, then you suddenly pop into the reality. This is a, uh, a woman, Sev Talk, who I've, um, her interview will be appearing on my YouTube channel, White House UFO. Um, and I did an interview with her and she wrote this book, uh, You Have the Right to Talk to Aliens. And this, this photo was only taken a couple of, uh, maybe a month ago or a month and a half ago. And here's her, her cat looking at an orb in the, in the corner of the room. And here again, you have sort of the idea that what happens in your brain, you think this is actual reality, you think that this is, this is real, and yet when you look at it, you, cats, dogs and all sorts of animals have all sorts of senses they can pick up stuff that you and i can't pick up and that just shows you that the the, the brain is very limited in in what it can do and it's giving you a lot of illusion it's making you think things that really aren't true and a lot of times animals can see things and hear things that you can't hear and it doesn't mean because you can't see them and hear them that they don't exist it just means you have to uh, either get an instrument to pick up these signals or you have to shut down some part of your brain that's causing the noise. Uh, this is the left brain interpreter. I won't go too much into this, but the left brain interpreter is a is a, a very important, uh, and neurology almost never talks about it. It's in the left brain, and it is, I maintain, is where the skeptic comes from. 
what the left brain interpreter is, is when something happens in your life. So for example, you have a UFO sighting, you go to talk to somebody on the street and you say, I had this UFO sighting and immediately the person says, ah, it was a plane, it was a balloon, it was, uh, you just saw it, you just imagined it. That's the left brain interpreter talking. What the left brain interpreter is, and it's an actual thing in the left brain, and this has been, there's been a lot of study done on this, is that when something becomes inconsistent in your life, when nothing makes sense, where some, something new comes along, like somebody tells you about a UFO or they saw a spirit or whatever, um, your world becomes inconsistent. There's sort of like a big hole in your, in your worldview. And what the interpreter's role is to do is to actually fill the hole. So it just makes up something. And so I call it the, the, the pathological liar. They call it the interpreter, but it is basically a pathological liar. And it's in your left brain and it's active all the time. And what it does is it, it jumps in and it makes excuses for things that are happening that don't make any sense. So um, now it's unlimited meaning. So, okay. Um, so basically we have, we have the, the left brain interpreter. So, um, and they actually did experiments with this to give you an example of how this works with the experiments. Because your left, your left side runs, your left brain runs your right side of your body. And your right brain runs the left side of your body. And this is very important. I'm going to show you something in a second to, to tune, tune into this. But so the, 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 um, what they would do is they would, they would have people who had epilepsy. And what they would do in order to stop the epilepsy, they'd cut what was called the corpus callosum in the middle of the brain, between the two brains. You have two brains, not one. And so you have, they would cut this thing to stop the signals from going back and forth, and they were able to control the epilepsy. But when they did that, then um, the image coming in the left eye would go to the right brain, and the right brain would get a, a certain message. And if it went, went in the, say, the, the right eye, it would go to the left brain. But the two brains couldn't communicate with each other because that's what the corpus callosum does. It sends signals back and forth between the brains. So the two brains can no longer talk to each other. So they would send a signal in through one eye. They would block the one eye, send a signal in through the other eye. So what they would do is they would send a signal, say, to the right brain through the left eye. And it would be, say, uh, a can of, uh, of Coke. And they'd say, drink the Coke. And so the right brain, which can't talk, the left brain is where your, your, audio, audio, your, your, um, your voice and your, your language is in, in the left brain. So the right brain can't talk. Now you've told the right brain, pick up the Coke and drink it. So it, it picks up the, the left hand will pick up the, the Coke and drink it. Then the, you say to the person, okay, so why did you drink that Coke? Now you're talking not to the right brain, you're talking to the left brain because that's where, the, where the, the language center is. But the left brain didn't, has no idea that you picked up the Coke. It has, it, has no idea why, it has no idea why you picked up the Coke. So what the left brain interpreter does is it just makes up an excuse. It just says, oh, I was thirsty. And because it, it has no idea. And that's what it does. And they did this over and over and over. They would send these signals to the one, brain, one side of the brain that can't talk. Then they would ask the other side, why did you stand up and walk around? Why do you do this? And every time it would make out an excuse and every single time it was wrong. It would just make stuff up. And that's where the, the skeptic, I believe, comes. It's a left rational analytical side of the brain and it's the skeptic side and it makes up stuff. And you got to remember with, with the, the stuff that I saw on the experiments they did with the left brain interpreter, it's always wrong. And so here you have this situation where uh, this thing you have to realize this is going on in your brain and that this is sending you bad signals which are mixing up um, your signal to get what is real reality you're you're thinking you've got reality and you're not now here's uh, an experiment that you you can see that's going on with the um uh the ufo community right now this is they're starting to look at um experiencer brains People who've had experience and they're starting to look at the brain and this experiment is being done by uh, Gary Nolan at Stanford and by Kit Green who used to be with the CIA and they're doing this uh, imaging of, of, the, of the brain and Gary Nolan was also involved in the, the Atacama being and I won't get too much into that and he basically had this idea that this, this being even though there was one in Russia had a number of uh, genetic mutations rare genetic mutations which made it look like this but it was actually just a 14-month-old fetus, and I say that a 14-month-old fetus will have these, these wide gaps in the skull that this thing didn't have, so I have my doubts about whether this thing's a 14-week-old 14, 14 fetus. 
but what they found was this uh, karat uh, putamen uh, section of the brain that was that was that seemed to have um, a different uh, heavier structure, uh, more nerve fibers or fibers in this part of the brain in experiencers that it was sort of um, it was involved, and they call it the antenna. And their interpretation was this is where experiencers are making the connection to the um, the others, see the aliens, whatever you want to call them, that the connection is coming through this this sort of an, an antenna thing, and that they believe that it would link back into uh, genes, that genes would um, cause the structure of the brain, therefore the function, and that the, the interpretation was that um, the uh, the beings may be mix mixing around with the with the genes, and therefore this section of the brain, and that if you could figure it out, you could create a drug which would stop the um, the aliens from you know messing around with the gene and stop the abduction experience. And this goes to this whole the whole idea, you know, there's evil aliens who are grabbing us against our will and stuff like that. So all that being said, they they had this sort of idea that this section is being used. And what I basically say is, yes, that may be uh, the section of the brain that may be lighting up, but it's much more complex than that. And this is, goes back to the idea that we sort of think that there's different sections of the brain doing certain things that uh, almost like in the old days, we used to think that bumps on the head, that this bump would indicate that uh, uh, this is part of, uh, part of your um, your personality and this part of your brain and 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 that it was all connected there's a certain sections and what I would maintain is that the brain is working as one and that it's not just this antenna that is lighting up when people are psychic there's all sorts of things that are lighting up um, different elements and it's much more complex than than one particular thing and the, and with this one thing where there where there's more structure what I would say is um, the reason that there's more structure there is that it's being used. And we know this from studies, which I'll get into in a minute with, with uh, meditation and stuff, that the brain is very plastic, that you can actually change the structure of the brain, that the more you use a section of the brain, the more that brain will grow. And that if the section of the brain is not being used uh, very much, then the system is pruned off, that these synapses and stuff are pruned off because they're not being used. So if there's a very heavy structure in the brain, this uh, putamen section, then that means that that section is being used. It doesn't mean that it's causing the 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 uh, the, the signal to take place. What I would say from all this stuff I've done on the 75 contact modalities is that the brain is just the idiot in between that there is actually the mind is not the brain the mind is separate and it's tapping into the brain and is using certain sections of the brain and this is one of the sections it's using to make contact this goes back to this phrenology idea that in the old days we used to think that there was just you know different parts of the head if you touch the parts of the head that had all these different things of, of people's personality um, now this is this idea they wanted to do a drug. So my, my basic bottom line to before we get into the contact modality is consciousness is equal to awareness. And um, people will say, oh, you have to be self-conscious. You gotta be, uh, some, some people were saying, oh, you gotta be able to speak a language. And you're just adding stuff on to this thing is basically awareness that if, if a, something is aware, then it's conscious. And so by this definition, everything is conscious, that you can go back and you can see uh, even back to the dual slit experiment or stuff like this, where uh, you can see particles, uh, photons and stuff that seem to be aware of when there's an observer there, when there's not an observer there. And uh, everything is conscious, so uh, an electron will have a not the same consciousness as you and I, but it's just built on this, this concept. And that, I think, the more we look at quantum physics and science, the more it's starting to back up the idea that everything is conscious and that the idea that um, I'm the only conscious one, that animals aren't conscious, the world is not conscious, therefore I can just use animals however I want, I can just use the world, it's very limited, I'm just going to use up the world, it, it's just an object, it doesn't have any consciousness, it doesn't have any soul. Um, these ideas are starting to fade away and the more we, we gather outside material, outside the brain and realize what's actually going on, we realize that no, everything is, is basically going to be conscious. Now, um, 
this right brain, left brain thing, I think is very important. This is where this comes to this uh, putamen section of the brain where you say, okay, this is causing it. And I'm saying, no, it's, we, we know. I mean, it's, it's very, very uh, uh, more complex than that. Uh, when I did my book called Inspired, The Paranormal World of Creativity, I actually came up with um, all these different uh, inventions and downloads and stuff like that. And I came to the idea that it was this right brain, left brain thing, that if you can shut down your ego brain, your rational analytical brain, if you can shut this down, you can tap into the field. So you have musicians who are very right brained and they can tap into the field. You have artists who are, are, are right brained. You have people who do meditation. You have people who have head injuries, uh, uh, autistic people who have left brain damage are suddenly able to do these mass, massive mathematical calculations. And so I had the idea, well, I said, it's, it's right brain, left brain. And so I contacted Hal Putoff, who uh, did the uh, remote viewing program in the 1970s. And I said to Hal, I said, did you guys look at right brain, left brain when you were doing the, the remote viewing with the psychic spies and stuff? And he just said, read chapter six in my book, Mind Reach. And when you look at chapter six in the book, it basically shows that, yeah, they had this idea back then. And the idea was that, um, let me see, hang on. Um, that that in the in the the brain, this was actually Hal Putoff's wife that had picked this up. Is that when you look at the stuff that remote viewers get, what you see is very right brain, left brain oriented. For example, uh, a, a remote viewer will pick up uh, the color of something very very clearly, the shape, uh, the texture, and these are all right brain things. But when it comes to the left brain stuff, the target targeting is not very good. For example, what's the size of the object? What exactly is the object? They can describe it, but then they'll misname it. They'll say it's a, it's a, uh, a, a swimming pool when actually it's a, a water treatment plant where they're misidentifying because the, the, the whole thing is the, le the left brain is being cut out. What you do in the remote viewing program is you shut down the left brain, the right brain taps into the field, it picks up the texture, the color, the shape, and stuff like that, but it's not very good because the left brain is shut off. And that's why when they do remote viewing, that's why they just give you a number. That's why they don't tell you this is a target in Egypt because everybody's gonna immediately guess it's in the pyramid. Once you give it, it some idea and the left brain starts to guess what it is, the rational analytical brain, it starts guessing what the target is, the experiment is over. You have to shut down the left brain. So that's why they only give the person a number. They don't give them any sort of uh, coordinates or anything, just a number and they make the, the left brain sort of uh, get out of the, the way. And that's when they say to you when you're doing remote viewing, they say, don't guess. Just tell us what you feel, what you smell, what you taste, all this kind of stuff. Just put down everything and we'll interpret it after as to what it might be, but don't guess. Once you let the left brain in there. So th this is the whole idea is that this, uh, whether you're psychic or whether you're t talking to aliens or dead people or whatever, uh, there is this component that it's not just one little section of the brain that, that, that is doing this sort of thing. We always want to go back to the materialistic paradigm that the brain is creating consciousness. And I will absolutely maintain it's the other way around. The brain is being used by the mind to send signals and almost like a TV receiver. There is no, t there is no football game in the TV. Uh, there's no little soccer players running around. There's no big stadium inside in the TV. Uh, the signal is coming from somewhere. The brain is just a sender and a receiver. So again, this is this thing of how many brains there are. Gizeniga, who is the father of cognitive neuroscience, said there's a confederation of independent modules working together. And this comes to this whole idea that we say, well, the brain does this, the brain does that. No. The brain is thousands of modules, according to Gizeniga, possibly thousands of modules, and they're all working together. And this is this oneness concept. And I maintain this is the number one message of the, of the beings that are here, of anything in that world will give you this oneness message. There's only love, there's only oneness, and the whole idea is that everything has to work together as one. So all the modules, maybe this module is uh, helping to do this part of the thing, whether it's a balance or a visual center or the audio center or something like that, but it's working with all the other sections of the brain. They're all working together as one, even though they're independent modules, that's almost like cells in the human body. So all, all the cells in the human body all work together to become one for the body to work. And when you have a cell that decides, oh, it's gonna be an ego cell, it's gonna just divide, it's not gonna die, that's called a cancer cell. The way the body works is that all the cells 
contribute what they can contribute and take only what they need. This is this concept. And it's the same thing in the brain that all the modules are working together, almost like a beehive. You get this analogy where people are very upset, like aliens on board a ship are very, be it's, like a, it's like a hive, it's a terrible thing. They're all working together, they don't have any personalities. But that is how the brain works, that's how the universe works. We are only a small component in the universe and we are all linked together in the universe and we have our piece to do in the universe. We are not independent things floating around in the universe, we're all linked together, we're all tied together as one, almost like, an entire, like cells in a human body. So this is what you got to remember with the brain. It's, it's much more complex than just one little section of the brain that is doing something. We always want to go back to say, oh, this little section of the brain is making you say, this little section of the brain is doing this. this and, and I maintain, no, it, it's, it's part of the process. Um, here's an interesting thing when we come to this right brain, left brain thing. This is, comes from uh, the, uh, the Aliens and the Scalpel, which is written by Dr. Roger Lear. He was sort of famous for doing the alien implants, taking out the implants in, in the bodies of 17 people. And he writes, and this is from his book, following our other factors that were found to be significant in Daryl Sims' study of 250 alleged abduction cases. So Roger Lear worked on a, 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 a alien implants and so did Daryl Sims. All objects were obtained from the left sides of the bodies. A significant number of other cases have been investigated that also show the subject uh, suspect objects occurring in the left side of the bodies of the alleged abductees. The key to this thing is, if this is true, if all alien implants are on the left side of the body, they're targeting the right brain. If they wanted to target your ra rational analytical left brain, which we think runs the world, they would put the implants on the right side of the body. They are targeting the right brain, the creative female brain, they have no interest in your left rational analytical brain. Otherwise, they put the implants on the other side of the body. And that's very significant. If that's true, that all implants are on the left side of the body, it gives you a, a clear interpretation of what might be going on with alien implants. Um, the, the, I maintain that the, the brain is like a, um, like a radio, like a battery operated radio, if you were to take that battery operated radio to Charles Darwin 150 years ago, Darwin would absolutely maintain that the London Philharmonic Orchestra was inside that radio. And you would say, no, no, it's not, no, there's no orchestra in the radio. He'd say, no, no, it's coming out of the radio. The orchestra is inside that radio. And he'd say, you know, that little round thing there with the, the gray, it's vibrating. Every time that the, the, the music comes out, that thing vibrates. It's inside that round thing, which we would call a speaker. And you would never be able to convince him otherwise. He would maintain because he has no concept of the fact that the signal is coming from outside. And we make the same mistake, I believe, in the modern world is we say, no, no, the signal is inside. The, 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 the voice is inside. Everything that's happening is inside your head. And I say, you know, be careful what you wish for because if you suddenly um, had your eyes and your ears, which are your, your predominant senses that make you think that you're inside your head, if they were on your rear end, then you would actually believe you're living inside you know where. And people get this idea that, that we are inside our head and it, it's the analogy of the radio. It, it, it is not that way. Consciousness is being projected somewhere else. There is no TV screen in your head. There's no little speakers inside your head. Um, it, it's happening somewhere else and we have to make this illusion. And the other thing is that it's, it's not an off on switch. It's like a, uh, it's almost like a thermometer or like a, a thermostat where uh, it's different levels. So when you get um, people, you're gonna get channelers and you're gonna get mediums and mystics and these sort of things. So you, like for a, example, a channeler, you have uh, say um, relay channelers, then you have trans channelers. It's different levels. It's almost like a, like a thermostat where some are good, some are really good, and some are really, really good. It's different levels. It doesn't mean that you either have the talent or you don't have the talent. It's how much can you shut off this sort of rational analytical side that's causing the, and causing the noise in the signal and the more you can cut off the signal, the more clear the, uh, or the noise, the, the clearer the signal will become. Um, the, uh, Ingo Swan, who wrote the, rem the remote viewing protocols, uh, said noise uh, equates to inaccuracy. And this is the whole concept, that your, your brain is very, very noisy. It's giving you all these optical illusions. The world is flat. The sun goes around the world. Everything's flat. It's giving you all these sort of things. It's giving you a lot of bad signals and when you can shut those signals off. So the whole idea behind contact modalities, if you want to talk to dead people or aliens or whatever, 
the, the idea is it's not turning things on, it's shutting things off. When you can shut things off, you can get rid of the noise that the brain is causing and get a, a clear signal. So back to this thing, I say this idea of having one section of the brain running the whole uh, psychic thing, it's, it's false association. And the analogy that, that I always use is if you have a fire in Northern California and you have 1,100 fire, firefighters there and you have a lot of smoke and a lot of, a lot of heat, it does not mean that the, forest, the 1,100 forest fires uh, guys, the f fighters, or the smoke or the heat created the fire. They are connected. Yes, they are part of the thing, but it doesn't mean that the firefighters started the fire because they happen to be at the fire. This is false association. It's sort of linking something that is part of it, but not the cause of it. Um, we, even from sitting, everybody's sitting right now, you have brain patterns. And this was shown on a number of, uh, one particular lecture where they show that your, your brain is, is lighting up all the time. And it comes down to this whole idea of uh, who's, who's making you sit. Is the brain making you sit or are you making uh, sitting and making the brain light up in certain ways where the brain is just responding to what, to what you're doing? Uh, when it comes to this, this uh, uh, putamen section, uh, we know for a fact that there was a lot of research that was done back in um, ten, a decade ago with the parahippocampal gyrus on the right side of the brain. So again, we're uh, here we're talking the right side of the brain, which is the, the active, you shut down the left side. And when Ingo Swan was in remote viewing uh, um, tests at Laurentian University here in Canada, uh, they were picking up very clearly that when he was hitting the target, when Ingo Swan would be on site with, with, a, with a prediction or the psychic uh, hit, when he was on this parahippocampal gyrus on the right side of the brain was lighting up. Now, it doesn't mean that that's what's causing it. It means that's part of the process. That's the firefighters at the fire, that, that it's being used as part of this process. And again, it's on the right side of the brain. It's not the, the left side. It's on the, uh, on the right side of the brain. And it, what he's doing is he's basically shutting down the left brain and lighting up this, this right part of the brain, which is picking up the signal and getting the correct target. Um, and if, if the target where they found in this experiment, if the person didn't hit the target, so you'd have a control group who was not psychic, uh, then this left interior frontal gyrus would light up when they tried to do the remote, the, the experiment. And so we, we have these, these two different aspects um, that show that um, all sorts of sections are lighting up. And there's a study that was actually done here. Um, the, 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 study, the study's findings are suggestive of an association between telepathy and the right parahippocampal gyrus. So in this modern stuff that was being done uh, at Stanford University with, with Nolan, with, with the, the, the work they're doing, they have not brought up this, this right parahippocampal gyrus. Now, it doesn't mean that's, um, that's gone away. I mean, that, that, those results were done 10 years ago, and Kit Green was actually uh, part of that process 10 years ago where they were going to run an experiment where they're going to put two people in an MRI machine. They were going to send a signal between the two people, like a telepathic signal, and see whether it, the, the brains would light up at the same time to see whether the signal was non-local. Uh, now, the, the, one of the, the, the ideas of, of the, the brain thing is you use it or you lose it. So if you're using a part of the brain like this uh, uh, putamen section, if you use it, it's going, to get, it's going to get bigger. It's going to be stronger. And if you, if you don't, you lose it. So this is the idea that the brain increases in certain sections and it, it writes off certain sections or prunes certain sections that aren't. And it's a read and write. So the, the, um, the, the brain is able to read and to write. It's almost like a cell where it, it, it brings in outside um, signals from the environment and then it writes the program in the brain to accommodate for that. So uh, you become sensitive to your environment and that's how you evolve by this read-write program. Now, I think oh, here's this pruning thing. I'll skip that. Uh, here's the idea that if you don't use it, this is this idea that if you take a, take a mouse at birth and you uh, cut off one of the, uh, you block one of the eyes with a, with a blindfold, uh, that, that will never, they will never develop sight in that eye. That it's an input thing that um, if it's not being used, you will lose that part of the, the, the body that, that, that's not being used. So it's this read-write 
and this idea where um, it, it programs based upon input coming from the outside. Um, like a semiconductor, it's almost like the idea where uh, you have muscle cells. So if, uh, say, Pia is um, just normal and then she starts lifting weights, uh, the signal comes from the outside to the, the cells in, in the muscles and says, oh, P is lifting weights. We, we got to get some muscles. We gotta, we, and, and so it will read the environment and will start to make muscle cells. And P will get stronger and stronger and stronger. And it doesn't mean that the, 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 the muscles are just uh, creating, forcing Pia to exercise. Pia is exercising and the muscles are being built because the, there's a read-write system that realizes that she has to exercise the same, uh, or they have to build muscle cells, the same as if you start running, your, your heart and your, and your lungs will start to create muscle or cells that will accommodate because you need more, more cells to uh, provide the, the energy you need to, to do jogging or, or running or exercising or whatever. It's a read-write system. And the same thing happens in the brain, that when parts of the brain are being used, so in this idea with, with, the, um, with psychic stuff, we can start to learn of what areas to do and how to turn sections off and how to tap into the system. We, we, I'm firmly convinced that we can actually now start to teach people how to do this stuff, but you have to understand how the basic system is working. That the, the, the brain is a verb, it's not a noun. We call it, it's an object, it's not. It changes all the time, it's like the human body loses. 3 million cells a second. Your body is changing constantly. Your brain is changing. It's cutting off uh, synapses and it's adding uh, neurons and it's based upon what is coming in, what the environment is telling. It's an actual thing that's changing and we know from plasticity through different things um, like um, uh, meditation changes the brain. We know a, a lot of stuff. You can actually change the structure of the brain so the brain is a, is a living, it's a verb thing, and you have to see everything in the world as a verb. Right now, we, we look at things as a noun. Everything's an object. It's, it doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have a spirit. It, these are things are just nouns. They're not. They're actually verbs. The entire universe is a growing system. It's alive, and it's growing. Uh, this comes to this thing that um, um, uh, Bruce Lipton talked about with cells where he would take a stem cell. This is back 50 years ago already, before everybody got into the whole genetic thing. He would take uh, a stem cell, let it reproduce, 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 until he had 30,000 stem cells in a Petri dish. And then they were all the same, because they all came from the, they were all the same cell, I, genetically identical. And then what he would do is he would change the culture medium for the three cells, break them into three different dishes, change the, the, this, the basically the blood, uh, for the three different, and he would get a he would get a a bone cell, a muscle cell, and I can't remember the other a muscle a muscle bone, and I can't remember the third cell was. But he'd have three different cells would grow in these things, and it was dependent upon what the what the medium was. If you change the medium, it would be a different cell. And this is this idea that the the cells are reacting to the outside environment and doing what they need to do to uh, to do it. Now, a lot of people will use this whole idea, and I'm going to sort of skip over this very quickly, is that, oh, it's all just, you know, it's a, it's a world with a quantum wave potential. And um, it's, it's quantum foam. The, the particles are coming in and out of the quantum foam. And I say, well, that's fine, but where the quantum foam comes from? And, and we're just making up stuff. What we do in, in, in science is we name things and we make them go away. We just say, oh, that's just a cell di dividing. Oh, that's just a, a you know, holog holographic universe or stuff. Well, where did this all come from? It's, it's, it's trying to put a, 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 turn things into objects. And that in a lot of senses, we're just sort of making up stuff. And that um, it goes back to this idea that consciousness is primary to, to, the, to the physical world. Deepak Chopra called it the Chittakash, the unlimited space of consciousness, that that is primary. And then you may get a quantum wave uh, potentials out of that or quantum foam, but you can't just start, almost like the idea where we get to start the universe with the, the giant miracle. You give me all the quantum wave uh, potential, you give me all the foam, give me all the energy, give me all the, the mass, and then I'll, I'll show you that it's just a random process. But you have to allow me to start with this giant miracle. I get to have all these things to start. You don't get to start 
uh, you, you have to explain where do things originally come from, what is the basis of the whole thing. And the more I maintain, the more we look at things now, the more it appears that consciousness is going to be primary and matter is going to be secondary. It's almost like uh, if you talk to people who've had the samadhi experience or um, a, sort of a, a, um, an experience of, of, of oneness or psychedelics, they will talk about this thing where it's quiet, it's um, unconditional love, all this kind of stuff. And it's the idea that, that, that everything is consciousness and it's very quiet. And then when you sort of like throw a stone into this consciousness, it starts to vibrate. And when you get vibration, you get physical matter. And that, that, that physical matter is just a, sort of a vibration of this consciousness. And that the physical thing is just a, a, an aspect of consciousness. Consciousness is, not, is primary. They are not two separate things. It's not consciousness and matter. Matter is a, a derivative of consciousness. If it vibrates, it's illusion. That's one of the things that's, that's in some cultures is talked about, which I think is right. Um, that which is real is that which never changes, which is consciousness, the, the basic bottom line. And so I say the brain, cre the brain doesn't create consciousness. Consciousness creates the brain. Um, this is a, a thing I use all the time. This is a meditation device. Uh, it's, call um, it's called a muse device. And what happens with this thing, it was tested on monks, and um, it basically is, reads your brain signals. And what it does is if it's very active, what you're going to hear is a lot of rain coming down. And so you, when you hear the rain, you go, okay, I've got to concentrate on my breath. Uh, let's, move, let's stop. Let's calm down, uh, concentrate on the breath. And then suddenly it will go neutral. Then suddenly it's, it, it's very quiet. And as you, as you get into that state, you go very quiet. And then when it becomes calm, then you hear birds. So this, this device can actually read your brain signals and tell you when you're in this theta, the edge of theta and alpha, which is where you're trying to get into this signal. And this is the concept that it's not, the brain is telling you to put on the muse machine and it's making all these, making you do all this kind of stuff. You are the one who's putting on the thing and you are the one that's making the brain meditate. The, bra the, the brain is not making you meditate and you can actually control it because it's very clear that when you're in this state, when, for example, you hear the birds and you get excited, suddenly your brain starts to uh, move out of this out of this state. You start thinking about something else, and suddenly the rain comes back. And so it's very very hard to stay in this state. And you know very clearly when you use a muse device that you that you are controlling your brain. You are actually uh, controlling your thought. And when your thought moves off the off the sort of the uh, the mark where it's supposed to be, uh, you can hear the noise that your brain is your your thought is going someplace else. Here's the parahippocampal oneness experience. The parahippo, uh, uh, the the parietal, the, uh, parietal lobe, sorry, uh, is on the right side, and these are uh, meditators who will do this um, uh, with the with the monks and people who are very good meditators, long-term meditators, and they show this this experience where on the right side it's very red, is very active, and they they quieten it down almost like a muse where you you get the birds coming. And when you shut that down, you get the oneness experience. So the, the parietal lobe gives you the sense of being in 3D space. And so people say, well, you get the illusion that you're in, you're in oneness. It's the other way around. It's, it's when you shut off the illusion that you're in 3D space, then you suddenly realize that, that, that you're in this sort of uh, oneness experience that you're, you're actually shutting off the noise and you're getting a better signal. Um, meditation, the monks have shown categorically in the research they've done with them is that they are able to control their mind at, at, a, at a great uh, ability and there's been a lot of study done on them uh, here's the whole thing with these uh, with this gamma signal where you have um, the, the, the the brain on the right is very very active and you can see with the uh, the long-term meditator monks I think this was in uh, University in Wisconsin where they do this where it all goes blue it's very high gamma very high to hit very hard to hit gamma and then to maintain gamma these are some of the highest gamma signals ever recorded in the human brain they're up 80 to 100 and it, gamma starts at 25 and they were very very high and they were able to maintain this which shows that it is the 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 observer who is actually controlling the brain it's not the brain is just accidentally doing this sort of signal you need someone who's done long-term meditation who's actually able to uh, give signals to the brain to give instruction to the brain that the observer is creating the brain. He's, he's making the brain do what it wants to do, not the brain making the observer do things. 
uh, the, the, the big Chandler Bashar, uh, who, uh, uh, Daryl Anka in California, uh, they wired him up to the machine. They basically showed uh, from, it's hard to see in the image, but the, the left side is the regular sort of brain before he channels. You can see it's sort of yellow, uh, and, and then you see it going into this sort of very quiet um, sort of gamma where sections of the brain are being shut down on the right hand side. And um, when they do channelers, they find that channelers are in this uh, gamma 45 to 50 uh, hertz uh, signal that they, it's not that the person's sitting there and pretending to be channeling, they actually are producing a very distinct brain signal. Here's the brain meditation thing where the structure of the brain is actually changing. And some of these experiments were actually, uh, one was eight weeks, one was three months where uh, the brain can change that fast. In eight weeks, you can actually change the structure of the brain by meditating. And so you have, uh, there you have the observer, you have the, the mind, which is the non-physical aspect, controlling uh, what we think is a physical uh, environment. It's, it's, it's the, the consciousness is creating the brain, not the other way around. Now I want to get to, oh, here, this is, goes to the basics thing, where you get a lot of these scientists are now coming along where they're saying consciousness does not matter. Matter is secondary. Consciousness is primary. Brain does not do consciousness. Consciousness does the brain. There's more and more of these people. John Wheeler, who came up with the, the idea of the black hole and the wormhole, stated no phenomena is a physical phenomena until it is an observed phenomena, which goes even to the idea it's a participatory universe, that you are helping to manifest what is happening around you. You think that you're sort of a, an observer, that you're uh, sort of a cork, going down a stream and the more you look at it, the more you suddenly realize that you are controlling what you're seeing. And it even goes to this idea that the concept that, that physical stuff does not appear until there's an observer, that you cannot have uh, physical stuff until there's an observer who's manifesting that sort of stuff. So the, the scientific field is moving very much towards this consciousness aspect. Here you have the open science. This is a bunch of scientists who have actually come forward now and actually have signed a, a sort of a, a manifesto uh, talking about post-material uh, science and the fact that they believe that, that the uh, material is not primary, that consciousness may be primary. And a number of very sort of major scientists who have signed on to this. Um, 